Galaxy mergers are a standard aspect of galaxy formation and evolution, and most large galaxies contain supermassive black holes. As these supermassive black holes eventually merge, Chiara Mingarelli studies the pulsar timing array concept and joins us now here in studio with more on her findings. Thanks so much for your time today. Hi, thank you. So nice to be here. Well, it's a pleasure. Can you start off by providing a little bit of a brief overview of pulsar timing arrays and why they are pivotal to gravitational wave research? Sure. So these galaxies have supermassive black holes at their centers. And as you said, when galaxies merge, their supermassive black holes start to merge. Okay. As they start merging, they create gravitational waves, mm -hmm. which are ripples in the fabric of space-time. Those gravitational waves change the distances between objects. So if one were coming from the ceiling and then into the floor, you and I would get closer together okay. and further away without us actually feeling like we're moving. It's okay. the space time between us that's expanding and contracting. Okay. So a pulsar timing array looks for these gravitational waves by monitoring pulses of pulsars. These pulsars are ultra stable clocks and we know exactly when their pulses should arrive at the Earth. So they're like lighthouses spinning around sending us light flashes. We measure when the signals do arrive we know when to expect them, and the difference between the two could indicate a gravitational wave is transiting the galaxy because the pulsars will get closer to the Earth and the signals arrive sooner, mm -hmm. and then the signals arrive later as the space-time then expands. And so this expansion and contraction also happens on very large scales, like galaxy scales. So as you're monitoring these, do they tend to fall into a rhythm where you can predict the expansion and contraction? Yes, eventually okay. we'll be able to do that. Okay, yes. that's the goal. Yes. <laughs> okay, yes. so given the nanohertz frequency of the gravitational waves that you're monitoring, uh, what unique challenges and opportunities does this present compared to higher frequency gravitational waves detected by like LIGO? Great question. So nanohertz frequencies are very strange to think about, right? A nanohertz is a billionth of a hertz, and what does that even mean? Mm -hmm. It means that it takes 30 years for one of these orbits to complete for the supermassive black holes. Okay. And that means that the wavelengths of these gravitational waves are light years long. So you can take that in stark contrast to the LIGO detector, which has made almost 100 uh, published gravitational wave observations. Okay. But the gravitational waves that they measure are much shorter wavelength. They're at high frequency, so at hundreds of hertz. And the signal stays in the detector for a fraction of a second. You're lucky if you get one second of a signal. Oh, wow. In pulsar timing, our signals are so long-lived that the first signal that we have evidence for, this gravitational wave background, took 15 years to detect. And when we eventually find signals from the individual in-spiraling supermassive black holes, those will be in our detector for 25 million years. Wow. So our sources are not transient. Okay. Once they're there, they're basically there forever. Okay. Uh, and they're at very low frequencies where everything moves very slowly. Okay. And so we need lots of time in order to find the signals, but then once we get them, we can, you know, dust them off like finding dinosaur fossils. Uh -huh. Like we first kind of know that it's there, and now we're carefully taking our dusters and figuring out what kind of dinosaur we found. Okay. I love that you explain it via dinosaur bones. <laughs> I love dinosaurs. That helps that helps put it into perspective. <laughs> um, so you have mentioned that there is evidence for nanohertz gravitational wave signatures in yeah. pulsar timing array experiments. Yeah. Can you elaborate on this evidence and also its significance to the field? Absolutely. So, first of all, we have evidence for a gravitational wave background. And this background comes from the superposition of hundreds of thousands, if not about a million, simultaneously merging supermassive black holes. So, at these very low frequencies, things move so slowly that all of the signals pile up. Okay. And so you can't just measure one signal, but you measure this aggregate signal from all of these simultaneously merging black holes. The amplitude of that signal can tell you, in turn, how many black holes are merging at the same time, what their masses are, and roughly how they're distributed in the local universe. And so it's the first time that we have any gravitational wave background signal at all. So LIGO has found these individual flashes of gravitational waves, these bursts mm -hmm. from mergers, um, but no one until Nanograv made their announcement last June had found evidence for a gravitational wave background. And so we're the first ones to do that. That's incredible. Yes. That's and then, so exciting. Yes. And our colleagues in Europe found a similar signal. So did our colleagues in Australia. And in fact, we've been working together for the last 15 or so years 
um, you know, sharing our data, trying to figure out if we all see the same thing with our independent versions of the pulsar timing array detectors. How important is that kind of global collaboration to really, I guess, like fact checking your work? So it's really important, and it's really hard. <laughs> but <laughs> I'm it is, sure. <laughs> yeah, it, but, but I can't stress how important it is. Mm -hmm. So in North America, we see pulsars that are in the northern hemisphere, mm -hmm. right? We can only see what's over our heads. Okay. And in the southern hemisphere, they see different sets of pulsars, and those all point to the galactic center. There's a lot more stuff that way. Okay. And so what we really need is all of the pulsars. And the only way that we can get the northern and southern hemispheres is if we all share our data. Okay. Um, but this is really tricky uh, on a sociological level, but also it's a technical challenge to combine data that are taken by different telescopes that uh -huh. have different instrumental noises, mm -hmm. um, different ways of reducing the data. All of these things are huge, big data problems as well. So how do you analyze the pulsar timing data to distinguish between individual supermassive black holes in binary systems and the gravitational wave background from cosmic mergers? Right, so when we look for the gravitational wave background, we do something called a cross-correlation search. And that's basically saying, I have all of these data streams from pulsars and the pulsars are all in our galaxy. As this gravitational wave background washes over the galaxy, it's gonna hit all of the pulsars in the galaxy and the Earth. So what we do is that we look for the same signal, this gravitational wave background signal, in all of the pulsars. And so I take a pulsar timestamp and another pulsar timestamp, and I say, what's common in these two timestamps? Mm -hmm. The only thing that should be the same is the gravitational wave signal, and everything else gets thrown out. Okay. And so the more pulsars you have, the more data you have, the stronger you can make your signal, because right. that signal is the same, and the more the noise melts away, because the noise in all the pulsars are different. Okay. So this cross-correlation search is how we look for the gravitational wave background. And the outcome of this is something called the Hellings and Downs curve, which we now have evidence for. Um, it was predicted in 1983, and 40 years later is when we found the first evidence for this. Wow, that's yes. incredible. And this curve tells us how the different pulsar pulses are correlated. So in addition to there being some sort of amplitude of the gravitational wave background that's set by black hole masses and merger rates, um, there's another geometric term that comes from general relativity. And that tells us if the pulsar pulses are positively correlated, so if they're bobbing together mm -hmm. in space time, or if they're anti-correlated, mm -hmm. bobbing like this instead. Mm -hmm. And only gravitational waves can imprint this distinctive signature in the pulsar pulses. And that's why it was really important to find this curve before we made any kind of claim that there was evidence for a background. Because a lot of things can create noise in your pulsars, and that noise might have easily been mistaken for a gravitational wave signal. Okay. So we needed to have both pieces of the puzzle mm -hmm. um, to make the, this claim of evidence for the background. Okay. Now, when we're looking for the individual supermassive black hole binary systems, we don't do this kind of cross-correlation search. In fact, one of the things that my group is working on right now is doing targeted searches for the supermassive black hole binaries. So we're looking at a list of galaxies that we think could host them okay. um, using statistical arguments. And then we say, you know, what does the signal look like if I point all of my pulsars to look there? Uh -huh. right? What if I don't allow the data to search over the whole sky, but what if I direct my searches at one specific point on the sky? Do I see evidence for individual merging supermassive black holes there or not. Okay. Uh, and we haven't found any evidence of that yet, but we do think that that's the next thing that we should be able to find now that we've found the background. So how have recent findings that you've been talking about from these pulsar timing arrays influenced our understanding of these supermassive black holes and their cosmic merger history? So our recent findings have been really important for even identifying the fact that supermassive black holes merge. Even though right now, you know, we're we're quite sure that supermassive black holes are creating this nanohertz gravitational wave background. There's slight possibilities of other things, but okay. we're pretty sure it's supermassive black holes. Uh -huh. Before now, there was an open problem in the field um, called the final parsec problem. And that was a theoretical problem that was proposed in the 80s that claimed that supermassive black holes will never merge, that they can get to within a parsec around three light years of each other. Okay. But then it takes longer than the history of the whole universe to get them to merge by emitting gravitational waves only. Okay. And so then, then they don't merge. Okay. 
Um, so one of the ways that you can solve this problem is by realizing that the supermassive black holes are not isolated. They're in the centers of these massive galaxies and there's lots of stuff there. And so what happens is that stars can cross the orbit of the black holes and get slingshot out and that carries away energy and angular momentum and the binary responds by shrinking. And they shrink and they shrink and they shrink each time a star scatters okay. off the binary until they can effectively merge by emitting gravitational waves. Okay. And so now we know that if there's a gravitational wave background, which there is, and if it's sourced by supermassive black holes, which we, we're pretty sure it is, then the black holes have to merge. So there is a solution to the final parsec problem. But it's just an example of how little we know about the life cycles of supermassive black holes. We know that it takes you know billions of years potentially for, to go from a galaxy merger to a supermassive black hole merger. And so finding this last stage essentially of the galaxy merger by looking at the black holes as they're inspiraling is, is the last step of the whole merger process and should fit into how we think the universe works. And you said that, that the problem you know, came about back in the 80s. Yes. So it's taken you know, 30 years to, to answer that question. Absolutely. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We had other hints before, some uh -huh. advanced computer simulations. People were relatively sure that this is true, but there's nothing like having a measurement. To yeah, the it. data helps, doesn't yeah, it? <laughs> absolutely. All right, so based on your journey from a PhD student to a leading researcher in gravitational wave astrophysics, what advice would you give to young scientists that are just coming into the field? I would tell young scientists to pick something that they like. Pick something that when you work on it, you feel energized mm. by it. Not something that's, everything is going to be hard at mm -hmm. some point, and you're not always going to be in love with your research. Right. <laughs> um, but pick something that, you know, really vibrates with you, that really jives with you, something that you could work on forever, that you really feel that like you can sink your teeth into it and you know, 10 hours can go by and you don't notice. Right. Right, like that kind of thing is what you're gonna be really good at because that's gonna be your secret sauce. No one else is gonna be able to do that quite like you. So find your special thing and then stick to it. That is great advice, and it is obvious how excited you are about your research, just in the way that you talk about well, it. What's cooler than <laughs> supermassive black holes? <laughs> I don't You're know. You're exactly right. All right, well, thank you so much for all of your research, and thank you for taking the time to talk with us today. Thank you for having me.